Hey, lacrosse friends. Thanks for being with us once again here on Lacrosse Link. Check out everything at lacrosselink.com. I'm Stephen Stamp, joined as always by co-host Tanner Fetch. I speak this week with Nicholas Midbow of the IBLA, one of the leagues that is growing, is producing players, and is hoping to really have an impact on the game in the United States in particular. And then Tanner talks to Moose Winnery, who is a graduate of the National Collegiate Box Series and was actually signed by the San Diego Seals. Uh, great talk. Again, goalie to goalie. Bet she's all about the goalies, and I think it's pretty cool getting the goalies on. So uh, a couple of very interesting discussions with some players from some leagues that are making a difference in box lacrosse in the United States here on Lacrosse League. Beautiful play, Eric Gray. He is having himself a tournament. So he's definitely uh, physical, um, athletic, and somebody to be watching for. In the middle, it just bounces off. But it's picked up and scores. And this is Welcome to Lacrosse Link, Nicholas Midbo, the GM slash forward slash pretty much everything for the Minneapolis Wheat Kings of the IBLA. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Thanks, too. It's uh, great to chat, great to catch up. Uh, I know you've been busy rowing as well as, uh, as well as playing lacrosse, but I want to start off talking about how you got into the game of lacrosse, specifically into the box game. Sure thing. So I always, I hate that I found the box game at 23 versus 13, but, you know, grew up playing field lacrosse. Uh, most Americans didn't start playing box till after college. Um, always something that interested me. A lot of the players I played with in college that, you know, were good finishers or had other good, you know, whatever that those skills came from the box game. And uh, so it's always something that I've been interested in. And then to have the opportunity to play in the IBLA at, in 2017, um, was my first true introduction to it. And then I've been going to pretty much whatever tournament I can since and, um, you know, playing as, as many opportunities as America will allow. And I mean, I've seen you at plenty of those. I've seen you at the Alice Robeski in Prague. I've seen you at the Laxnai down in Onondaga, a couple of fantastic tournaments. Uh, we're here mostly though to talk about the IBLA, the Interstate Box Lacrosse Association, started by Brandon Shiraga. And you played for a year in 2017 when it got going. But then in 2018, you created the Minneapolis Wheat Kings. And what led you to start that team and how's it grown since then? Sure. So one of my primary goals with the team is to provide like a high level opportunity for people after college. Uh, I do just think it's generally a little odd that, you know, for so many people, sports is such a big part of your identity until you're 18. And then for a lucky number, you know, they get until they're about 22, 23, but then it's over too. And, you know, in my day job as a consultant, I think I've picked up more skills from the locker room than the you know, classroom. So I just think it's, it's very weird that it's just a big part of, like I said, your identity, a big opportunity to build some life skills and things like that, that just ends for so many people. So I wanted to really provide a high level opportunity for guys to keep doing that. Um, and when the opportunity presented itself, the league was growing a little bit, expanding from two to three teams. Um, I jumped on the opportunity and we've grown by leaps and bounds since. So we're um, already have started season number four for us. Um, season one, we just missed the national tournament. Season two, we ended up finishing third nationally. And then last year, we were the runner up to a really strong Philadelphia Funk team. Um, going into year four, we've got, you know, some additional coaches, some uh, another Canadian, which is always helpful. And then guys are really taking it a little bit more seriously now, knowing we finished just, you know, right there. Um, so we're practicing a couple times a week. Guys are watching film and uh, it's been really cool to see for me, like I said, as someone who takes really any opportunity to play the game, um, and, you know, to be around a group of guys that also relishes those same opportunities is, is huge. And you talked about the league growing, the, the Minnesota League specifically, but the IBLA has grown leaps and bounds. 2017 started with eight teams in three leagues. And I went through and checked it out because it's, it's almost unbelievable how fast it's growing. The next year, 16 teams in six leagues. 2019, it goes up to 25 teams in nine leagues. Last year, um, 32 teams in 10 leagues, one of the slower growth years. But uh, even some of the teams, can, some of the leagues couldn't even play last year because of the pandemic. So you expected that kind of a, a slowdown. Then this year, 
52 teams in 17 leagues. There's leagues in Louisiana and Texas and the Pacific Northwest and California and Michigan and Nebraska. Um, all the, the New England, a couple in New York, they're all over the place. What have you seen over the years from the Minneapolis perspective? Uh, and of course, a lot of it you're going to see from a distance in the other leagues, but then you get to nationals and you see the difference on the floor and how good the product is. Certainly. Yeah. I think like you said, touched on it, both sides are definitely true um, from just kind of a brand and experience perspective. You know, the teams are growing in terms of the number of players, the dedication, how seriously they're taking, you know, being a truly organized group. And then the on-field product reflects that, um, you know, a lot of big names were in the tournament last summer since it was really the only summer lacrosse that was going. And then this year you're already seeing, you know, roster graphics from people on, you know, on random throughout the regions. There's some big names out there that, you know, want to play high level lacrosse, whether that's a, well-known field player who's, you know, stepping inside the boards for the first time or, you know, guys that have played on, you know, reservations for their whole lives or guys coming down from Canada or whatever it is. So, I mean, it's been truly incredible to see the exponential growth of the league from our first nationals trip in 2018 um, to, you know, where the league is today. It's night and day. And you mentioned some of those guys who are playing. I, I look at the Salt City Eels who strike me as a real threat with Corey and Clay Arnold kind of running the team. They've got Brendan Bomberry. They've got Leroy Halfdown, a whole bunch of talent um, on that team. There's talent throughout the league. And it, it seems like the overall quality of play is rising. There's still a lot of guys who are new. The, the spread from the top to the bottom, I think, is pretty substantial. But uh -huh. uh, the overall quality is improving. And I think the, uh, the top end, we've talked about this, the top end teams are getting – pretty good like i'm not saying the teams in the ibla would go in and win a senior b league in ontario or, or the can am but i think some of these teams could compete with some of the the teams that are playing senior b and certainly senior c in canada sure yeah i mean if you look just from our roster perspective our top five six guys have all played canadian senior b senior a um you know granted the difference is it's 20 guys that have done that versus five but um you know from where everyone's learning how to run a two-man game three, four years ago to now where it's guys that are truly on the cusp of, you know, the NLL or guys that can be on a, you know, like you said, a senior B roster. It's, it's been pretty cool to see the growth. And you talked about some of those guys, the impact they have and some of the Canadians coming down and playing. You've had a handful. I know uh, Mike Maudsley and uh, Corbin Cow, some of the guys, but you also this year, you've made a real point about how important it is having Derek Lloyd because you usually get the offensive guys. He's playing defense. That's been a big difference maker for you guys. Absolutely huge. Yeah. And, and for him, as someone who's, you know, currently in the league, so hungry for opportunities, you know, he's about to play a game in a couple months of, you know, first truly high level game he's played in a while. And so he's there at every single practice. He's there getting coaching guys up, you know, we'll play a random pickup game on a Thursday night and he'll be, he'll be there an hour before stretching. So he's always got some things to say. He's hungry. He's in obviously unbelievable physical shape. Um, but mentally too, it's just really cool to have him, kind of share his knowledge of the game, his passion. And that really is, you know, fires guys up to want to keep working and keep showing up day in, day in, out to get better. And for people who don't know Derek Lloyd, he does play for the Victoria Shamrocks in the WLA and the Vancouver Warriors in the National Lacrosse. And he's really established himself at the pro level. So you're obviously a lax junkie. You're a big time lax guy. But I want to touch quickly on your new rowing passion. That, uh, that we share. I'm a former Canadian national team member and you are getting out in a boat. You've been on the water. I am. Yeah. Today was my second day out on the water. So a little sore, a little sunburned, but uh, it was a good time. We were on the training barge yesterday and then we actually got in uh, an eight and a four today. And you know, we got only a couple strokes we were on, but when we were on, we were humming and it was, it was a good time. It's a big jump from that training barge to the real boats. Oh yeah. I mean, half the battle is just making sure you're not rocking too much, but it's been a good time. And, you know, like some carry over to what I like out of team sports, it's, you know, guys are pushing each other to do it. And you know, we, we all kind of suck there, but everyone wants to improve and, and it's really cool to see and to have opportunities to continue to, you know, learn a new skill in my late twenties is pretty sweet. So. Very cool for the lack side and the wrong side. Always great to catch up and appreciate you coming on lacrosse link, Nicholas Minpo. You as well. Thanks for having me. And yeah, we'll be uh, chatting either lacrosse or rowing very soon. For the 14th year, the Ontario Lacrosse Festival has rolled into Durham region, boasting over 500 teams and more than 10,000 athletes. 
It's a celebration of the game of lacrosse. It's uh, home to 44 provincial and national championships. We run about a thousand games here over the 10 days. It's an invitation to see our game at all levels. There's children here from ages five to about 21. The event is spread across venues throughout the region, but the hub of all the action is Whitby's Iroquois Park Sports Centre, Canada's largest municipally owned recreation facility. We offer sides that many venues can't. And over the years, I think our staff go above and beyond. I have many conversations with the folks from the OLA who commented on how helpful our staff is. And I think that relationship really uh, helps us to ensure that the festival comes back. There's four pads here at the Oak Park Sports Centre, which if you're trying to run an event, is just, you know, it's optimal in terms of energy in the building, in terms of opportunity for children to see their brothers and sisters play, for families to come and celebrate the game. We have great space for vendor opportunities. There's probably about 34 vendors here. The economic impact of the festival is estimated to be over $5 million. We get to see teams uh, from all over the province and also all over the country, uh, so it gives us very good exposure. It's very important for us to, to work with the event organizers, support the local sport organizations, volunteers, the officials. Everybody comes in and really does their part. All right, lacrosse fans, Tanner Fetch here with Skyler Moose, winnery of the San Diego Seals in the National Lacrosse League. Welcome to the show, Skyler. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank no thank problem. You. I'm thinking that you're enjoying the sunny San Diego weather right about now, aren't you? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you can really see it. I got a sunburn going right now. I've been yeah. out in the sun a few days. But, yeah, I got some uh, cheeks kind of doing the yeah. same thing, but not as sunny as yours by the looks of it. So, <laughs> you know, so, you our sauce weather isn't, just, isn't as good, I don't think. But <laughs> yeah, yeah right. hard to compare. <laughs> it is. It is for sure. Now he says he's got some family in South, so he's going to have to make a trip up here and I'll show him around. That's the plan. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. So let's jump right into this. I'm going to call you Moose because that's what you go by and that's what uh, everyone seems to call you. So Moose, uh, you grew up in Colorado, another beautiful place. Hey, you know how to pick them. Um, oh, why don't yeah. you tell us your story about uh, how you started lacrosse and where it all began? Yeah, so uh, the first the first time I actually saw lacrosse, my neighbor showed up to my house with a lacrosse stick and I was like, what is this sport? And uh, he kind of was just, hey, try this out, come to practice. And uh, from there, I kind of fell in love with the sport. Uh, that was outdoor originally. And then a few years down the road, I uh, got into indoor lacrosse with uh, the coach at DU, Matt Brown. He started up a program called Denver Elite out there. and uh, yeah, from there, it was just kind of finding that love of the sport, finding out I really like to be goalie and, you know, to see a bunch of balls hit me every once in a while is pretty fun. So uh, <laughs> kind of grew on from there. And after that, it took me down the road to uh, call or call or I'm sorry, high school. And then I played lacrosse in high school, played indoor through high school, just through Denver Elite. And then uh, finally got to college where I played uh, outdoor at Colorado College for a year and then I uh, transferred out to a school in Texas named Texas State where I graduated and played at the MCLA level but uh, during college I got to I got a chance to start up in that uh, the CCVLL league which is out in Colorado and that kind of gave me my shot where I, I got a few looks in the league I you know, got some opportunities to talk to some people and sure enough it led me out here to San Diego which was you know a cool journey. So. For sure. That's an incredible journey, right? Especially for a guy who started in the, in the outdoor, the field game, then transitions into the box game. It's not always the easiest transition going that way. Either, either way, really, especially in our position, being goalies, I'm a goalie as well. Right. That position isn't transferable. So, right, definitely. so you've got to start over, right? Yeah, it's a to total new sport. It is for sure. So you played in the CCL League or Col Colorado Collegiate Box League. Um, how important was that for developing yourself into the pro caliber goalie you are today? Yeah, I, I think it was very important. So uh, the first year we actually played in the league, this is just a little tidbit, was we used the walls, right? The big, uh, you know, yep. triangle sticks. And uh, yeah, it was it was fun to use at first, but really that next year was when we took that big step of going kind of the NLL rules and going down that road, going with the spoons. And uh, yeah, that was uh, that was kind of like that turning point where I was like, oh, this could really happen. Like these are the rules of the NLL, you know, we're going to really try to mimic the play, the style, everything about it. And uh, yeah, it was it was. Yeah. The first second year, I'm sorry, the year I actually got the first championship for the Fighting Bison. We uh, the league just kind of took off. We got those two new teams in um, a bunch of kids were trying to come out and play. You know, we had to, I think there was a few cuts on rosters even so. It was, a, it was a good year to see it, and that was the following year that Trevor Baptiste just went to the NLL with the Wings, right? So 
it was uh it was kind of a oh hey this this is real like we can do this now you know this league is going um and it really it kind of gave me hope and i know for sure i just went back to colorado and a bunch of the guys were coming up to me and my, my old friends were like hey we have a shot now you're in the league now we have a shot and i was like absolutely you guys got a shot so it's uh it's important you know it was at first i think a lot of people were skeptical and like hey what is this and I had to make that choice. I had the opportunity to go up to Canada for the summer and play with, you know, maybe a junior intermittent, intermittent team. And uh, I just kind of took that shot. I was like, Hey, I'll trust Matt Brown. I'll trust the Colorado league and, you know, see what they can give me. And sure enough, that was uh, all I could ask for. Right. They, they really helped me out. They grew my game a lot. They taught me a lot. I, uh, I got to experience what it was like to be, you know, like even a captain on a team and taking a team to the national championship, which was cool. But yeah, it was a lot of growing, a lot of self growth throughout those years and kind of finding out what a true box goalie kind of entails. Right. And even now I'm still learning and just like trying to be a sponge out here in the NLL. Cause as soon as I stepped out here, it was a whole new world again. I was like, Oh, you got to learn shooters tendencies. You got to find all these other aspects of the game that you weren't even thinking about in college leagues. But uh, yeah, it really helped my growth and kind of started that click in my brain that else oh, is going to be a lot of learning here. For sure. And I think, you know what, as a goaltender, like I'm 29 years old, I've been playing my whole life, but I'm still learning too. There's always a new move that somebody tries or something new. Right. And then you're like, okay, okay. I haven't seen that one before, but now I got it right here and I'm ready next time it comes. Right. So you're always just absorbing and learning. And I don't think that ever stops really. So right. absolutely. Yeah. Um, like, and let's talk about the fans perspective or even from a player's perspective, how would you describe the game day experience within the Colorado collegiate box league? It's, good turnout for fans and obviously a good opportunity for you to showcase your skills in front of the pro talent and the, the scouts. But what was the overall experience? Uh, it was a good, great experience. I remember the, the first, the opening weekends are always the best weekends, right? You have the most fans there. Everyone's excited to see the games again. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall it was, you know, you would, you would show up hour early. You guys, we had locker rooms that we would go in, get together as a team and, it was pretty much just a normal game. We would go at it. And uh, at halftime, we had a bunch of our kids that at the time we were coaching Denver Elite out there. Um, we had a bunch of our kids come out at halftime. They would shoot out on the floor. So we always had them out there watching us, which was really cool to have uh, kind of that fan base, you know, that, hey, these kids are looking up to us. They want to be in this league one day. And, uh, you know, that's what they're working for. So the overall experience of it was a lot of fun. And like I was talking about, we went to Nationals uh, 2019, I believe. and uh, that was that was one hell of an experience right there. And so I'm, I'm excited to see what this year brings. Um, currently, right now, I'm helping out with the California uh, Collegiate Box League. So same NCBS, all that same ties. But uh, I'm helping out with the Southern team, which is the Royals. So uh, we actually have a tournament this weekend against the uh, Northern team to see who goes to Nationals. So I'm excited to see how that works out. And hopefully the, uh, the league just keeps expanding to all these other states, which is it's cool to see right now. It does seem like it's expanding and growing, right? And the game of box cross in the States is growing, which is exciting, right? Because in right. Canada, you know what? It's everywhere. We all play box cross. Field isn't as big of a thing here. And it seems like right. vice versa in the States. But now you guys are getting hungry for this box game when it's such an incredible game. It's feisty. Shot clock's going. You know, you're in constrained spaces. Like, it's it's a whole different game, but it's fun to watch, fun to play. Definitely. So, I totally agree. Yeah, it's uh... – it's a good, it's a good version of the game. I'm a very big box fan. I'll say that. <laughs> there you go. Finally, we converted another one, right? We got you. <laughs> we got you into the box game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're coaching the Denver elite or you were now you're helping out uh, in Cali and you're doing the junior NLL. You know, I know for myself, finding a box goalie coach was like finding a golden nugget. Like they're very hard to find. Right. That right. lots of times we're self-taught millionaires in most ways. So um, how important is it for you to give back to these goalies and help them learn the sport? It's uh, yeah, it's really cool. It's uh, like you're saying, it's tough. It's a, uh, it's kind of a position where it's good to have the coaching and Hey, like, you know, you can do this or this, but a lot of it falls back on that player and just learning, Hey, this is the motion I've got to have. And kind of going back to what we were talking about with the, the mind game, right. You've got to have, you know, Hey, this guy shoots here constantly. He's going to shoot near side. He's fakes near side, wherever it is. Right. So uh, I try to teach the goalies a lot about that instead of, you know, I, I give them the free range of, Hey, however you want to play, if you want to be the goalie making the stick saves, whatever you want to do, you just got to save the ball at the end of the day. And they understand that. 
but uh, a lot of them are coming back to that traditional now, you know, now what we see in the NLL where it's just like the big stance, right. And we're a lot of leaning, a lot of popping the arms up and out, out. Right. And uh, yeah. it's been good. It's, it's kind of tough. Like you were saying, I, I never really had a goalie coach either. I had Dylan Ward for a little bit who gave me, you know, just tips here once in a while. I think I had him for like a few practices, which was awesome. And he gave me a ton of things that I still use to this day, but uh, overall it's, it's definitely a, it's a, it's a tough thing to teach for sure. You gotta, you gotta know what every kid kind of has in store and uh, you gotta work around that. If that makes sense. For sure. Yeah. Each, each goalie has their strengths and weaknesses and their style and, you know, they adopt different things as they learn. And it's, it's just kind of a fluid position in a lot of ways. Right. So right, exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. And you know what, I'm excited to see you on the floor with the seals What's it going to be like for that first ever opportunity to get between the pipes in the big leagues and, and take home a win? Oh man, I'm, I don't know. I'm excited. I've, uh, I've been dreaming about that day for a very long time. So it was a cool opportunity that they gave me to come out here and been working my butt off trying to get that, you know, just at least a roster spot to try out and see what I can bring to the team. So hopefully that first day comes and when it does, I'll, uh, I'll do my best out there, you know, really give it a good go. For sure. And when it does, Moose, I'll have a jersey on for you, buddy. I'm going to be in your fan booth cheering you on. I appreciate you joining us here on the Crosslink. Um, I'll be sure to make sure everybody knows who Moose Winery is. And uh, we'll continue to watch you grow and hopefully see you on the floor very, very soon with the Seals. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hi, this is Jaden with Al Anderson Source for Sports. Excited to tell you that we got all our new lacrosse product in for this upcoming season. Whether you're playing box or field, our lacrosse experts are going to make sure we get you into the right equipment to elevate your game. At Al Anderson Source for Sports, we know our stuff. And welcome now, lacrosse fans, to the rundown section of the Lacrosse Link show. You know, I get caught up in the Canadian game being from Canada. And especially when I was growing through the ranks and the junior and stuff like that, you really get focused on that. And then the NLL is the pinnacle. But as you continue to grow and you go to Prague and you go to the States, you start to learn about these leagues that we showcase in this episode. And you start to learn about these players from all over the world and how big this game is really getting. Speaking of international lacrosse, Team USA has held its first ever Sixes training camp in preparation for the Olympics, which I think is really cool because obviously America plays the field game in a traditional way and they fully 360 and went with the sixes training cap instead of the traditional field training cap in hopes that the Olympics do come through as promised. So, I mean, you're going to shed some more light on the mm -hmm. Olympic committee, but I think it's really cool that USA dove right in head first and being one of the first teams to try it out. Yeah. I've got to point out that if they'd done a 360, they'd be going exactly the same way they were. I think you meant a 180. Is that a common well, mistake? Funny. It's okay, <laughs> Benji. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's very cool. And, you know, that they mixed the men and the women and had some fun with it and switched sticks and amazing uh, steal on a long outlet pass to end that game. It was pretty exciting stuff. Um, and speaking of exciting stuff, the IOC has fully recognized lacrosse as an IOC sport. Now, the key thing to keep in mind, it is a huge step. It does not mean that lacrosse is in the Olympics, which you see all over Twitter. Everyone's like, lacrosse is in the Olympics. It's not in the Olympics yet. There's a lot of work to be done, but this is a massive step in that direction and really good news. Definitely is good news. I mean, you're one step closer. That's where you want to be. We all want to see it in the Olympics. I mean, this TSN is starting to cover the game now. NBC is covering it in the States. The Olympic Committee is giving it recognition. Feels like lacrosse is really getting a stranglehold here in the sports world, and I love it. And we're a part of this, so it's. Awesome. I want to throw, yeah, I want to throw one other thing in there. I think it's great. It's great news. It's a big step. I hope that one of the next steps is the Iroquois Nationals being included in whatever's happening. Obviously, they're in the World Games. It might be a while before we hear details of how the Iroquois can be included in the Olympics, but I really hope that is part of it because it just wouldn't be the same without them. I'd have to agree. I don't know the ins and outs of how you get to your eligibility within the Olympics. Like obviously countries do, but being um, the Iroquois nation, there's going to be some different uh, 
rules and regulations that they're going to have to meet. And I'm not 100% sure on how that's going to unfold. And that should be something we're going to do a little digging for you and try and figure that out for all our lacrosse league fans at home. Now let's transition here into the Rocky Mountain lacrosse season. So positive feedback on the rule changes, which were the NLL rules that were adopted. But Ontario and Rocky Mountain and BC are all kind of doing a little modification different than each other as well. Um, so there was some hiccups with the officials coming in, knowing CLA right up here, and then having to adopt some of the National Cross League rules. But so far, the reception's been good by the teams. Um, the tricky part was the arenas don't have a half court line. So the half court back over violation, okay, so there's a little bit of there, right? Um, and the restraining lines are so close in the Canadian Cross League, whereas with these type of rules and the face offs that they went with, they're typically further away and the players are allowed to burst in. So there's been some stipulation about what direction do they want to go? Let the players go or wait till the ball clears the circle and the sticks being six inches apart at the face off, the ball tends to roll around. So they've had to keep them tight, like a traditional CLA draw, but they're letting them clamp and tussle around like an NLL draw. So it's kind of like a hybrid, if you will, but in good reception. So. Yeah. Interesting. It's interesting to see those details and that uh, Rocky mountain season going lots happening out in BC with the junior A and junior B playing and senior B um, in Ontario, the OJLL season about to get underway as well. Uh, two weekends where teams are playing four games each. It's a hectic schedule at the Toronto rock athletic center. Um, we are going to try and cover this as best we can for you. Unfortunately, I have to admit, we are not hearing back from the OJLL. We reach out to them repeatedly. We just don't hear from them. We've been trying to get Mark Grimes on the show, the new commissioner, for quite a while, for three months, and uh, just not having much success. So a little frustrating to not get any uh, any response from the league. But it's, it is great that they're getting rolling and some interesting stuff one thing i know they're having 1999 players so 22 year olds but orangeville for one has not kept any of their 22 year olds they want to go more of a development role which makes sense to me for this year so you've got players from some of the great orangeville players scattered in brampton and mimico and toronto and st Catharines. so uh, an interesting twist that is pretty interesting but it does make sense exactly what you said this isn't a full year for a mid to cup run. Yeah. So use this year to develop your team, pick up some of the players, let them get a taste of the junior A speed. And then next year you come back stronger. So if teams are stacking up on the 22 year olds, they might be a little, be in a tougher spot moving forward here in the future years, mm -hmm. because they won't have these young guys developed yet. And it'll take an extra year. And you know what? You made sense. Exactly. You're bang on right there. I love it. Thank you. Now IBLA, we're talking lots of leagues, RML, OJLL, IBLA, um, there's been an article on the National Cross League by Bill O'Brien, Thriller Lacrosse, um, but he did mention that the games are competitive and fast with the IBLA, which we kind of talked about within our episode here, um, but that the NLL is starting to take a look at these pros that are on the brinks, and hopefully um, they did build a relationship anyway in previous years, but hopefully some of these guys can start working their way into the big leagues. Um, it, it, it is, it's, it's growing league. It's, it is fast. Where is it on the level with Canadian junior A and C or senior lacrosse, it's tough to say, right? But yeah, it's a ways behind still, but it's, it is pretty new. But there are guys, I mean, Derek Lloyd is an example that, that Nick Midbow mentioned, who is playing in Minneapolis uh, while he's going to chiropractic college there. So they find that fabulous, just outstanding. There are some NLL players who are playing. I mean, look at the Salt City Eels. They've got some NLL guys, Brendan Bomberry and um, Leroy Halfcount is playing. So uh, it's, it's growing. It's getting better and better. It's really on an upward traje trajectory, which is pretty cool. Um, Less cool is what happened to my good friend Casey Vock. Uh, sent shockwaves through the lacrosse world. I would encourage you. We're going to put up the the GoFundMe link so you can, if you're able to, to help Casey out. I know he is getting a lot of support. A uh, good friend of mine, Casey, was in Baltimore driving home. Random situation where he got shot um, as he's driving his car. Went through apparently in his one temple out under the other eye, uh, all kinds of damage, just missed his brain. So he was very fortunate to be alive, um, but a lot of problems that he is, he is obviously facing and people are trying to come up with some support for him. Um, I, a quick story. He uh, asked me once for what my favorite colors are for a lacrosse team and some different things. I was like, hmm. so he, I said, you know, I like white, blue, and red. I, I told him, you know, I think newest Mr. Samabellis have about the best kit in the game. And uh, 
he sent me a package. It just shows up with a, a Sam and Belly's jersey and t-shirt, some other t-shirts from different events, uh, a, a head, a red head with blue and white traditional stringing, uh, gorgeous stick that I use for my, my sick work all the time. Um, he is just one of the best people in lacrosse or anywhere. So if you can help him out, if you know Casey, you love him, please help him if you can. Our thoughts and prayers go out to Casey and his family as, and we wish him a strong recovery. It's hard to fathom that something like this can happen because you just don't think of it happening when you're going hiking that this, this is the way your day is going to end. But we're here with you, Casey. And again, the GoFundMe page is here for anybody who wants to help him out. We appreciate you all joining us on the rundown section of Lacrosse Lake. We've got more exciting topics and coverage on our website, lacrosselink.com. Don't forget to like, share, comment, tell your friend, tell your mom, tell your grandparents. Everybody needs to know what's going on, and we're here to keep you in the loop. How do I, how do I save your shot? It's the question of the day. Woo. You like that right side right now. I must be giving you a lot of it. <laughs>